So uh, just to get started with a sort of an interesting hypothetical uh, question. If you could go back in time five to 10 years, would you have spent more of your resources to help yourself and your organization to invest in and prepare for the internet? So obviously, you know, in looking back, we know the value of internet. And if you didn't know how much value it was going to be, would you have invested more? And I would probably venture to guess most people would say yes. So the value of analytics, data science, and AI will rival that of the internet. This is not my opinion. This is what I think a lot of industry practitioners also believe in. And if you sort of hear about all the different things that data analytics and AI could do for a person or organization, you'll sort of understand where the value of analytics coming from. Data and analytics really is in all of our everyday lives, but we don't sort of think about it in a very specific way, just because all of us day-to-day -day think about getting information and making decision out of information. But there is so much technology out there in today's world that you're able to actually not only get better decisions, but also get them faster, get more of them, and really try to compete through being more intelligent than your competitors. Today, we're going to talk about the four initiatives to retail wholesale e-commerce excellence through data and analytics. I'm just going to short form and say retail wholesale e-commerce. So I'm kind of grouping them all together. Uh, a lot of the tools I'll be talking about is all sort of interdisciplinary between those, those different industries. So I'll just ask Michael to send out the first poll question. And just so everyone can sort of have an idea of what functions you're working in the retail wholesale world. Yeah, should be launched now. And if you don't know where the polls are um, on the bottom right, you can see there's a little activities button with the um, square, triangle, and circle. Click on that and you should see some polls there. Maybe 30 seconds. I can see the results in real time. Looks like management is winning. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll just stop it off there. So I'm just going to take a quick inventory. Uh, the first one, we got one vote for inventory, five for management, one finance, and three others. Uh, those of you who are others, I see looking for jobs in analytics. Anything else for those of you who said others? E-commerce? Thanks, Sarah. Measuring promotions. Okay, so thanks for sharing. So uh, this is good for me, but also sort of for the rest of the group to see, you know, as we have sort of interactions and discussions where other people are coming from. So a little bit about myself. Uh, again, I'm Eric. I saw, I think a couple of more people joined the, the chat. I'm Eric, I'm the CEO and founder of Advanced Analytics and Research Lab. Um, I have three degrees. Uh, I have a business degree and economics degree where I specialize in econometrics and macroeconomics. And I have my master's of science in analytics, all from Western slash Ivy Business School. I've done a lot of projects in anal analytic consulting. So I started my career in analytics at PwC Analytics Consulting. And I've been teaching statistics, analytics, and economics for almost 15 years now, everything from you know, workshops that we host through our organization to, uh, I've actually taught the, uh, and lectured at a uh, master's uh, class as well. Uh, we've done a couple of technical workshops from SQL, Python, uh, Power BI, Tableau, and sort of data visualization type courses. And sort of introduction to analytics and statistics as well. Our organization, we've been around for about five years and we're, we're based in Toronto. And I think most uh, of the people on the call should be in from, from Canada. I know there's one person from New York. 
So more sort of personal and fun facts about myself. Uh, just here's four things. So one is uh, I went to Italy to learn how to make latte art from the guy who invented latte art. It's this old Italian man, and his name is Luigi. That's a, that's a fact, not a joke. Uh, I'm also a big motorcycle fan. So that's uh, second picture of me on a racetrack. I am a big believer in sort of democratizing analytics, and that's why I started Advanced Analytics and Research Lab, and that's why you know, we run these workshops for both industry experts and practitioners, but also for people who just want to get into analytics and learn more about it. And on the right side is uh, me volunteering, so I'm a big uh, proponent for social work. Um, I volunteer at a women's and children's abuse shelter called the Redwood in Toronto, and I'm also on the board for a technology and arts activism society. So just a really quick introduction. So someone says you're from Morocco, welcome. And from Germany, oh my God. <laughs> uh, Events Analytics and Research Lab, we're a hy hybrid services and solutions company. So that means we do both sort of development, custom development work for our clients, but we also have in-house software and solutions that we offer to our clients with uh, software as a service and analytics as a service business model. For us, analytics and data science is not just a department, it's not just a profession, really it's a mindset for problem solving method to achieve excellence. And we really believe that it should be available for everybody. We are a one-stop shop, so we do solution consulting services education, and our mission is to provide organization with the fastest and easiest way to gain full analytics capability. We sort of say for the price of one analyst, you can get an entire specialized team. So right off the bat, I just want to frame analytics for the business world. Really, there's, I see two big sort of a faction of analytics. One is analytics in traditional businesses that supports core business functions. So analytics can support marketing, finance, HR, management, revenue, logistics. You can use analytics for continuous improvement. You can do automation on your data and information processes and pipelines what if it's reporting, data pipelines, analysis, or decision-making. But there's also analytics that's core to business. So analytics and data science is a core service offering. So as an example, um, delivery dashboard that you built to provide to your clients so that they can see when your uh, items is being delivered and where the item is, on, is it on route, is it still in the warehouse, and things like that. Uh, providing analysis recommendation engine for products on your e-commerce website, that's analytics, that's part of a, your business offering and value you provide to your clients. And a wide variety of things from embedded analytics to AI in applications and machines. So I'm going to organize then again for retail and wholesale for analytics topic to break it down by analytics topics and then breaking it down by retail and wholesale topics. So to break down analytics problems in the analytics topics, I sort of have these 10 steps mapped out for an analytics journey. Most organizations sort of go through this journey. It might not be linear, it might, you might jump in between, but this is sort of the traditional path. So an organization starts with no data, collect data, you do reporting, you do ad hoc analysis, you do business intelligence, so like automated reporting. And then you get into events analytics, which is what I call, you know, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. And then we get into machine learning and artificial intelligence. And as you sort of move along that spectrum and sophistication, your ROI increases. And just sort of looking at from our perspective, analytics projects, we usually do projects in the two to 10 X in ROI that will sort of be completed within six to 12 months. So poll question number two, uh, where does your organization and team lie on the journey? So I'll show that journey again. Uh, pull it up. I'll give everybody 30 seconds.
five votes. Did everyone get their votes in? Give you five seconds. Cool. Okay, so let's see. Zero at data collection, five at simple, oh, six for simple reporting, one for events analytics, and three for AI. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, so most organization, and between Michael and I, we've probably talked to a couple thousand different organizations for the past five years. Um, most organization, I would say, lies sort of around reporting to business intelligence. Business intelligence, if you heard of tools like Power BI, Tableau, ClickSense, LightSense, things like that, there's sort of automated reporting and a lot of organization and IT innovation arms are now investing pretty heavily into business intelligence tools, which means most people are still sort of in the reporting and ad hoc analysis stage. And that looks like it tracks what we have in the polls as well. And we have three votes in AI. Um, I think maybe one or two of those are people from our team. Um, but um, it is kind of interesting because there's an interesting gap where machine learning AI, even though the way typical organizations look at it is sort of you go up the ladder and you increase your sophistication, there are specific tools and specific functions within organization that sometimes you sort of skip all the way ahead. So that's just an interesting thing to note. And pillars of retail and wholesale analytics, so breaking down analytics topics by retail and wholesale uh, topics. I'm not going to read all of this. This is a, I promise this is the most wordy slide we have. This is just like a very comprehensive thing. So um, we have six pillars here. So customer focus, you're looking at everything from segmenting customers who are understanding their purchasing behaviors and their retention and lifetime value and, and what kind of things they buy and what are their demographics and things like that. For inventory, you're looking at everything from demand forecasting to what you want, what, when you need to purchase, when you need to purchase it, where, where does the product that you purchase need to go for your inventory and things like that. For product mix, you're understanding everything from, um, you know, pro, pro, product baskets doing correlation analysis to, hey, what kind of bundling can you do on your products? Uh, can you do recommendation for specific customer types? For supply chain, uh, understanding sort of supply chain risk, optimizing and streamlining your supply chain. Uh, the big topic there is always demand prediction, but demand prediction really you can probably apply across this entire spectrum. Profitability and revenue management. So everything from dynamic pricing and revenue maximization, optimization to really just understanding profitability for your products. Um, you know, a lot of organizations we talk to even have a hard time to understand the profit for all of their SKUs if they have more than, you know, 100 SKUs because, you know, a lot of times your, you know, your accounting system and your product system and your marketing system are all very sort of siloed and perhaps disorganized and to combine all of them together actually requires a lot of data engineering. Marketing, uh, understanding, the biggest one obviously is to understand the ROI for the channels. How much is your dollar spent on advertisement for one channel generating in returns at the end of your sales funnel and conversion and things like that. Some other common analytics topics, these we hear uh, not necessarily applicable for organizations. So some organizations have delivery and fleet management problems. So if you own your own truck fleets or if you work with a delivery, uh, third party delivery and logistics provider, you know, understanding you know, how fast are things getting delivered? If you have trucks, you know, are, are the trucks being maintained properly and things like that. Uh, people analytics, so everything from scheduling to understanding safety, efficiency, training, morale. We've done really interesting projects for big organization on people analytics understanding retention of people, uh, understanding competencies, succession planning and things like that using analytics. Equipment, so if you have equipment, whether if it's printing, logistics management, forklifts and things like that, what are the investment on it? You know, should you in-house it? Should you rent? Things like that, understanding downtime and how it affects your overall profitability. 
And then we have things like safety. So understanding uh, safety within your warehouse or your factories or whatever, understanding the root cause and things like that. And that leads us to the third and final poll question. Uh, where can your organization benefit the most? On the pillars of retail and wholesale analytics. Michael, if you want to bring that up. Thanks. Yeah, it should be up. Cool, I'll give everyone 30 seconds. Product allocation acquisition is the most popular one. Pretty spread. That's interesting. <laughs> All right, I'll give everyone another 10 seconds. Okay, uh, let's see. Three votes on product allocation acquisition, one for inventory. The HR one was me, so you can ignore that one. Uh, one for advertising, two for a customer journey. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I would say that's pretty close to what we, what we see as well with our, our own clients. And at the end of the day, you know, if you can integrate all these data into a centralized brain, whether through a center of excellence, your own analytics team or data warehousing, you'll really sort of increase the overall intelligence of your organization. So the benefit of analytics, uh, a lot of times, you know, if you guys are, are going to sell analytics to, to your management team, or if you are the management team, here's our the benefit, whether if it's financial, intangibles, or otherwise, here are just some of the common ones that, that we see. So 50% plus decrease in data information errors, 50% plus decrease in time spent on manual data entries, uh, pipeline and reporting tasks, uh, greater than 5% increase in customer acquisition, retention, loyalty through personalized messaging, services, recommendations, greater than 5% increase through pricing optimization and dynamic pricing, greater than 5% increase in ROI for marketing efforts through spend allocation optimization, more accurate inventory optimization and sales forecasts, which will lead to more revenue through lower stockout and increase in working capital availabilities. Sometimes you don't have a very specific use case for analytics. So here are sort of three broad ones. One is uh, just overall increase in understanding what's happening within your organization process. So going from, I think something happened to I know there's something, this problem happens 78% of the time. And to ultimate switch, which is more action oriented, I know this will happen 80% of the time if I do X, Y, Z. For automation, uh, getting real time data information, and the faster you can get information, the more sort of profit you can bring. An example for that, let's say you sell a commoditized product on Amazon. And if everybody that sells the same product decreased their price by 10%, but you don't notice it until, you know, one month later when your analyst actually goes up and, you know, collect all the data onto Excel, that means there's one month of potential revenue loss that you could have gained if this was this data collection was more automated. So just an example. Um, more, you'll also get more time from automation on repetitive tasks and getting time back, obviously it's a no brainer, but you know, we also say, hey, that you can focus your time on more high ROI efforts, whether, whether if it's from uh, customer service and things like that. Reactive versus proactive. So some problem we can solve before they happen and the rest we can prepare for. So just to give some examples, um, this for this case study, uh, there's an e-commerce retailer. They wanted to build an inventory management system because they have both stockout and also understocking for their 
uh, sorry, stock out and overstocking for, for their inventory. So we helped them build a uh, uh, inventory optimization system using a variety of deep learning time series techniques through time forecasting, as well as economic order quantity and restocking management. And this integrated solution then was able to report on, hey, this one SKU, it looks like we're running out of your safety stocks. Here's how much you should order based off of your lead time, your cost of carrying and the cost of delivery. And you're, then he's able to really optimize his entire system for his warehouse. Uh, we're able to help him decrease stock go and then increase revenue. Another example, uh, an industrial wholesaler that has over 10,000 SKUs, uh, they asked us to look at pricing. So historically, they price based off of sort of baskets. You know, you have a, a group of products from this one supplier and, you know, they just add on, you know, 5% for margin and sort of just sell it that way. We help them identify the SKUs that are very, very popular uh, using these like RFM techniques and we segment them into multiple groups. The really high ROI groups, we then make suggestions, whether if it's increased pricing or actually talking to the customers to, to make sure that they are still loyal customers and see what we can do with it in terms of uh, incentives and things like that and loyalty. We're able to identify a lot of opportunity and at the end of the day, help them increase their profitability by over 5% through pricing optimization. So jumping right into sort of the four initiatives, um, strategy, tracking, culture, adoption, and execution. So I'll start with strategy. Uh, strategically define your data and analytics goal with your executive. And this is kind of a funny loop thing because a lot of times analytics is used for tracking your goals. So like your marketing have your have goals of X, Y, Z, and you're using analytics to track your goals. But then the analytics function itself, you should also have a strategy and go for it for itself. So there's sort of two ways I look at it. Um, there's a bottom up approach on building a strategy and then there's a top down approach. So bottom up, really you're looking at what you currently have, how you're leveraging it, where are the gaps and where do you want to go? So some assumption checks, uh, Number one, recognizing that data and analytics is something that requires multiple disciplines. You really need usually three main groups, uh, management, the subject expert, and then the IT team. The analytics and data science is sort of encompassing all of that. Dashboarding and BI really is not enough. You really have to think you know, ahead on you know, where you want to invest in terms of advanced analytics and AI. Certainly ha not having a plan is, is not acceptable in today's world and technology is moving so fast. Even for us, you know, we, we run an analytics company, but there's so much new technology that's coming out all the time. It's almost a full-time job that we always have to keep on top of these different tools and technologies and methodology that's out there. Your competitor certainly is all working on it and all of you are here, so you're also thinking about it. And it's definitely as affordable, you know, we hear people say, oh, you know, analytics, data science, AI, that's too expensive, we can't afford it. Um, it's not true. Uh, as long as you sort of understand how it works and where you can add value, it's a, uh, in terms of ROI, like I said, this should be an ROI activity and not a cost sink. You need analytics to be competitive and it also helps you increase your profitability. Top-down approach. Uh, so the top-down approach is really understanding sort of goals and activities. So. The question you should ask yourself, you know, what are, what are our organization's main objectives? And obviously that's a very broad thing. And then you can segment it up, out by function. What is inventory management team's objective? What is the marketing team's objective? What is the operations team's objectives? What is the e-commerce team for objectives? And then how are you actually tracking those objectives? Are you able to track the activities and inputs that leads to those objectives? How often are you actually reviewing the numbers or is it just a monthly report that you look at your financials or are you able to dig even deeper to say, oh, here's our marketing channel, here's the conversion rate we have on it and then things like that. What process do you have to improve your process? So the process to improve process, which um, really continuous improvement. Uh, and how do you revolutionize your most important activities? So building an analytics 
and data strategy. On the data side, really you're looking at collection, storage, and utilization. Security and privacy is super important, but we're, we won't talk about that, but that's obviously a whole topic on its own. For analytics, uh, finding out where the low hanging fruits are, um, there is a sort of a large pool of opportunity for analytics. Do you know what they might be for your organization? And really think creatively and figure out where you should prioritize and you should build a, you can then build a roadmap for the next 12 months on which projects to pursue with cost and value. And again, this is really a multidisciplinary thing. So you have to have involved management department heads and your analytics team. If you don't have an analytics team, maybe a, a technology team or an innovation team. It's also a balance between defensive and offensive. So defensive, you're looking at minimizing downside risk. So for certain industries, you will find that their data analytics strategies are a lot more defensive. So if you think like the banking sector, um, governments, military, they're a lot more about minimizing downside risk. And for certain organizations, you can be a lot more offensive on your analytics. So usually these are like tech, more technology forward looking companies. You're proactively and creatively using your data. And this is sort of similar to defensive and offensive. So passive and active, but it's also, also a little bit different. Using the passive, you're using the data when, when it's needed. So you're, you're pulling the customer and transactions information out of your uh, transactions database or your CRM, but only when there's a problem. And when there's an issue, you, you sort of look at it, you try to fix it, but for the most part, ignore it when everything else is fine. So it's very transactional and operational. Whereas active analytics, you're, you're looking at the data that you have, trying to figure out opportunities you can find within it. And people say, you know, data is the new oil. You have to, it's a, it's a thing you have to mine, you have to look through it. It's a, it's a treasure trove of information. If you're able to leverage it, you can use it to drive efficiency. You can use it to drive profitability and new customers and new revenue. And you can also think about how to bring new ideas so that you can bring value to your clients, not just to your own operations. Many organizations really are too passive and too defensive with their data and analytics. And really we're, we're here to sort of help drive that, that change and transformation within, within our economy. And also sort of to talk about the downside of this, everybody here heard about you know, Moore's law, which is every, I think it's like 18 months, technology costs decrease by half and sort of on the flip side, performance of technology doubles. And that, what that means is it creates this exponential curve. And if you look at the straight line, you know, right now we're at 2020, but as time moves on, the gap between organization that actually invest in analytics versus one who don't actually gets bigger and bigger. And, you know, the last, the most bottom line, you can think, you know, what is the slowest to adopt? Oftentimes just, you know, the more traditional industries, people say kind of like government regulators and things like that. And you can see like technology firms obviously grows at the fastest pace. And then there's sort of the companies in between. What does analytics do for management? Uh, so this is just a sort of summary. So provide information for blind spots, deal with problems proactively. It helps you find levers to drive bottom line, pass down time through automation. And for me, I, I think this is the most important thing, which is um, thinking intelligently about your operations and Analytics is able to help you ask more questions and more thoughtful questions because it helps you dig deeper than just the, the surface level numbers. The second initiative we're talking about today, so tracking. So deliberate and holistic performance tracking for continuous improvement within your organization. So I get this question a lot, uh, how do you define metrics and what to track? Obviously, you know, there's organization that don't track anything and there's organization that tracks everything. How do you, how do you find the balance? So the way I sort of think about that is through design and systems thinking. So really, really simplified. Uh, all activities within your organization are linear or circular. It's either input, there's a process and there's an output, 
doesn't matter if it's information, doesn't matter if it's product uh, or service that you're offering. It's, it's either linear or circular. Circular is more of a feedback loop. And within that linear or circular process, there is activity within those and every step has its own input and output. So most of the organization are only measuring output. But what you should really be doing is then actually understanding and break down the whole process, understand how your, 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 your whatever it is, go from input to process to output. And if you're able to measure every step along the way, that actually gives you a lot of information on where you need to fine tune your processes, where things might be breaking, how do you catch them if they're breaking uh, as fast as possible and things like that. And also want to make, make a note of one last thing. There's a lot of different ways to measure the same thing. Different departments measure different things, um, measure the same thing differently. You know, uh, there's a, a metric that we get a lot, uh, days on market. If you talk to the management team versus the sales team versus the operation or inventory team, they might all have different metrics on how to measure days on market. Not only can you break it down by sort of different processes, but you can also break it down through different uh, time frames and different, you know, even ways to calculate it. Typical progression for tracking and reporting. So once you have the metric, you're collecting those data, then how are you, how are you reporting it? So most organizations are probably level one. So you have high level tracking of your KPIs. You're tracking things like delivery, your inventory levels, um, your marketing spend, uh, customer lifetime value if, if you're a little bit more advanced. You do reporting uh, on top of that. So you're actually understanding trends. So not just looking at a customer's lifetime value, but you're also breaking it down into, okay, for customers ages between 20 to 30, here is their lifetime value, here is their retention. Can we then segment it and make some sort of decision to decision out of that to reach them better or give them better product recommendation or better marketing? Number three, centralizing and aggregating data and automation. So once you have uh, the data tracking, you have the trends. Are you able to automate that? Can you centralize all of your information together? So centralizing information, uh, actually quite hard to do. So in typical e-commerce, uh, retail, and whole call, whole, wholesale organizations, you have your database that manages transactions, you have your potentially marketing databases, or you, know, you have reports from your marketing agencies, or you have Google Analytics. You have other things like maybe a CRM and, and a sales tool, and you might have another management tool, you might have an inventory tool. Can you bring all that information together automatically so that you can then see uh, at a single glance, hey, this one product is being bought by these type of customers, and this is how much inventory we have for this product. Uh, and we actually spend a lot of time helping organization getting that information together because it is actually quite hard to do. Proactively use analytics then to find opportunities and doing everything from like demand predictions to doing large scale system and marketing optimization, understanding longer term seasonality and things like that. And then finally, the last step, uh, actually having an automated AI to tell you everything from point four. So when a team is more sophisticated, start integrating and automating prediction optimization reporting. Okay, the third initiative, culture. So establishing culture through a collaborative learning. Here are just some of the symptoms that we see. So looking at an okay team versus an excellent team. And an okay team doesn't necessarily mean is, is a bad team or anything like that. It's just you're not really leveraging technology to its full potential and data to its full potential. So things like, hey, I've been doing it this way for the past 20 years. Sometimes people tell me that and in my head I'm like, are you, are you trying to tell me that that's a good thing or a bad thing? Because you can sort of look at it both ways. Uh, has no data or analytic strategy. Has poor tracking on your major activities. You have unstructured reporting. You have spreadsheets in multiple locations and, and, and stakeholders. 
no processes for continuous improvement, no learning and development program, and no mandate for management to invest in innovation or technology. As opposed to uh, analytically excellent team, as a defined data analytics strategy, as a drive to be the best in class, so either have an innovation or an experimental mindset, it tracks performance indicators, so not, not just the outcome, but also the processes and the inputs. Has structured reporting that supports strategy. So your if your strategy is say, hey, we want to reduce uh, customer churn by 10%, do we have a report every single week that look at those numbers and make adjustments and in an iterative way? Has systems or databases for all of your data. And even if you're a smaller organization, you know, it makes a world of a difference if you just have Excel libraries in your folder system that is organized. A lot of times, like, I, I think the starting point for data is organization. It's like, imagine having a, a library, but no system on where the books are. You just have like piles of books everywhere. How are you gonna find information that way? And an excellent analytics team has a defined process for a continuous improvement. An okay versus successful project, uh, okay project has tools that's one off and not ROI driven. Oftentimes has low adoption because there's misalignment of process, people and strategy. And a lot of times there's skepticism within an organization on the usefulness of data and analytics. Whereas a successful analytics project, uh, you want to be best in class. You're open to explore outside the norm and challenge the assumptions within the organization. You want to integrate tools for the whole system. You have a cross-disciplinary team. And you use analytics to change the economics and business model, not the technology. So just a little bit on the last point, really where we find the most successful analytics projects are the ones that you're challenging, not just the technology that you have, but you're also challenging how you're doing things. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give an example. So the inventory management example that I had earlier, um, you know, it, it, we're not just brought in to build an inventory management system that tracks inventory. We also brought in a new methodology for inventory optimization that include using economic order quantity to, to figure out what is the optimal way to purchase inventory and procure inventory so that you have the highest revenue for the lowest amount of cost. And finally, uh, I will say education is a low hanging fruit. If, if anything you get out of this presentation, I would say try to bring more education to your organization. And anybody, whether if it's frontline workers to mid-level managers to high-level executives can benefit from learning more about analytics, not just the methodology, but also the tools. Uh, I really think you can learn like the basics of most BI tools in two to four hours, and you can learn the basics of R and Python and data science within eight hours. And I'm assuming you know how to use Excel. I'm assuming you have, you know, high, at least high school level math. And I know this because I, been teaching analytics for you know three four years and at least for these specific workshops and I know no it can be done. If you don't know know Excel, uh, certainly you know I I do hope everybody with an organization that deals with any numbers should should know how to use Excel very very well. And Excel, there's multiple levels, right? There's basic, in, intermediate, advanced. Whether if you're just doing little formulas all the way to using pivot tables and power queries and things like that. Never stop learning. Technology moves super fast. Uh, understanding the fundamental of how analytics and stats and how it applies to business works really helps you speed up your learning anyways. So, you know, really getting that foundation down. Analytics will either give you or your competitor a significant bottom line. And I'm really hoping it's going to be you and not your competitors. And just the last, uh, I think, two slides, uh, adoption and execution. Uh, execute, test, adopt, learn. So the value of analytics directly correlates to how well you can com communicate and implement change. It's not just like a software you buy and you're done. Once you have the software, once you have the database, you have to use it. And how do you drive change of value from that? Uh, these are, I kind of stole this five-star approach from a business textbook, but 
it still applies, you know, analytics excellence, you really have to have people, structure, objectives, process, and system, all of that aligned together for it to work really, really well. Just the process and the system itself, and that's what people typically think of, like, oh, I just have to buy Power BI and we're done, right? No, that's not it. You have to really align it. And like I said, it's a, it's a mindset shift. It's not, just a, it's not just a tool that you buy or a department you hire. Here's like a typical process flow for analytics project and data science project, the life cycle. So you start with discovery. So you think, hey, there might be some opportunities in uh, our marketing channels. So you take all of your marketing data, you analyze it, you understand, okay, you know, if this channel has the best conversion rate. Why is that? You know, is it because this customer segment all goes there? After you do analysis, you present your finding, you talk to different stakeholders, you validate your assumptions and your findings. And then maybe, hey, you want to do a build a development or analysis or a tool on top of that. So there's sort of two paths on analytics. You can either say, oh, it's all analysis. And this is what we call EDA, exploratory data analysis. Or you can actually build tools, right? You can say, hey, I notice you know, people who go to our website uh, have really, really high ROI. We should really try to upgrade our website to have better analytics and have you know better tracking. So you know, do development, and then either you end there and you give a recommendation and sort of pass it off for execution, or you iterate on whether it's something that you built. If it is something that you built, then you then have to support and maintain it, whether if it's like a Python code or a Power BI report, or even just a reporting process. And finally, uh, just some common pitfalls and how to avoid them. Uh, BI tools is built, but no one reads it. I see this a lot. Uh, a lot of times people think, hey, I'll build a Power BI report. You'll talk to the stakeholder and the stakeholder says, hey, it'll be great if I have a BI report that tells me what my uh, conversion rate is on our website. You'll build a tool, but then you show it to them, they're like, oh, this is great. And then they never read it again. So number one is make sure you're building tools with a problem in mind and you're actually integrating it into a standard activity. Integrating into a standard activity is something like, okay, let's say every Wednesday we have a marketing meeting. Then every Wednesday you bring up this marketing Power BI report and you're saying, hey, let's look at it. Where is, it, where is things not working and where is things not working? So actually having it as your standard activity. Uh, and really any reporting that you build that doesn't go into standard activity, um, a lot of times it just, the probability is that it's going to sort of die off and no one's going to read it. Decision made and analysis to justify. We also, we get this sometimes, not a lot. Um, sometimes a management team will say, hey, like I want to build a new business line and can you go analyze the data and show me the points that prove it? Right, so it's sort of backwards looking. You should be analyzing the data and make your decisions, not you already made the decisions, but then you're analyzing it to prove your case. What I would say to that is try to stay as objective as possible. Uh, point out points of consideration, but you know, if, you, if you're working for your boss, then obviously you just have to do what they say too sometimes. Uh, over engineering, I would say most business problems are pretty simple to solve from a tech standpoint. No need to build a website, no need to build a, this is a joke, no need to build an optimized simulation model with a stochastic forecast. Start simple, then add complexity, and you can then build that balance on where, how, how advanced you need to go. Finally, the lack of understanding of data science and analytics function. Um, a lot of time, people just don't understand how data science and analytics apply because it is, it is really complicated and it encompasses a lot of different disciplines and topics. So definitely engage in cross-education, training, collaboration, uh, be open, ask lots of questions, and recognize also the importance of understanding it from you know, the top to bottom. If, if management is not driving it, a lot of time analytics initiatives don't tend to work out well either. So that is all. Um, if any of you want to chat more about analytics, uh, we're happy to do so. Uh, please follow us, uh, rate us on Facebook, Google, or webinars, and I'll open it up for, for Q&A for the last 10 minutes. So if you want to stay, stay back and chat,
can do that. Thank you, Eric. Um, I know we had one question in the chat um, from, sorry if I pronounced wrong, Gaurav, who wants to know more about advanced analytics. So kind of um, what is the difference between business intelligence and advanced analytics? Um, and then kind of goes on to ask any recommendation um, for those who are in the business intelligence stage, um, want to create more insights on AI and machine learning, kind of how do you get to that next step? Great, yeah, so um, advanced analytics, um, I'm not sure if you saw the slides earlier on, but um, usually I'm talking about descriptive, predictive, and optimization. That's like the three main topic in advanced analytics. And it's like BI, you can kind of say is descriptive analytics, but it depends how it's being used. And honestly, sometimes BI tools, you can also do advanced analytics on top of that. Um, but the main difference I would say is advanced analytics, you really have to understand more about statistical methodology. So from the most basic statistics is, you know, under using averages, right? Your, what is your average sales last week or the sum of it? And then you can go into, okay, um, understanding the, the spread, the standard deviation and go into doing regressions and, and then doing forecasting and then doing optimization modeling. Each one of those is like, you can literally get a four year degree on those. Um, so it, it, it is kind of complicated, but it's like, also there are tools out there. So as an example, um, let's say you're using, you say Tableau. Yeah. In Tableau, there's like different forecasting tools you can use. Um, you can also do like custom coding. So in, I know in Power BI, you can put Python and R code. So if you have a data scientist, science team that built, there is like, predictive models, you can then import it into your Power BI. So there is there is some overlap. And let's see, your second question, recommendation on those who are in BI stage, want to create more insights on AI machine learning. Um, I would say sort of two approach. Uh, one is uh, bottom up and top down. So bottom up, you're looking at what data you currently have your BI in your BI, your data lakes and databases figure out where there might be some potential value you can bring by doing forecasting or optimization on top of that. And then the other way is top down, which is, okay, what are some main problems within the organization and goals? And the sweet, sweet spot is usually where those two things meet. So as an example, bottom up, you can say, okay, you have um, inventory information um, and you, you think that, you know, predicting demand for various SKUs will help you, uh, help your procurement team understand inventory a lot better, uh, then you can then build an AI tool for that. So it's really, on how you move forward, it's really a strategic thing. And obviously you have to get buy-in and there's a, there's a whole politics side of things too. Uh, we'll be sending us presentation after. Thanks, Melly. Are we hiring people in analytics? There are lots of people hiring. We are not currently hiring. Uh, Eric, I think someone also had their hand up. I don't know if they took it down now. Um, does, I can't see it, so it seems like they did. Yeah. Um, uh, Karuf, uh, any way to connect with us? Yeah, I mean, we our emails and contact information will be spent out uh, along with the slides. We actually, on our website, there is a free education portal. So we post all these YouTube videos, uh, all these videos up on YouTube, but we also have an education portal where all the slides are and, and things like that. You can actually join the education portal. We have courses on Python, Power BI, databases, um, specific industry type courses and things like that. And it's, it's all free. Um, uh, let's see, none of the tools I've seen have good UI for funnel conversion dynamically generated. Have you seen any tool that has such capability? We usually custom build those. Yeah. It, it, 
I think the problem is even something as simple as understanding funnel conversion, almost every organization sort of look at it differently. So the standard tools are very basic. I'm, I'm like imagining, I don't know if that's what you're thinking, like the Google Analytics ones. Those are like, like either in a table form or you can like sort of customize it on Data Studio and stuff like that. They don't, they don't look good and it's pretty rigid. I would sort of pull those information off and sort of build a reporting for our clients. Any in-person programs? Uh, not right now, but we're hoping we can run some in-person ones maybe later in the year, but COVID, COVID pending. Uh, job notification. We have a career page if you want to check that out. Camilo, are we moving to an era where big data analytics provider are becoming industry standards? and where all the analytics will be templates and where the differences will be made by people who analyze the analysis. So that's a, that's a interesting question. So, and really good question too. I'll, I'll break it down. So the first part, um, big data analytics provider are becoming industry center. It, it does seem like it's moving that way. I mean, I'm sure you all hear, you know, it, uh, Amazon makes all of their money from their Amazon web services and their big data analytics platforms, Microsoft as well, and Oracle and SAS, obviously. Um, yes. So the short answer is yes. Um, but there's also a lot of other tools that's very specialized that I do think a lot of customizability will be involved. And that sort of relates to your second question. Our philosophy is that, uh, well, two things. One is analytics is such a complicated topic that a typical organization, especially a traditional business, will not be able to truly understand all the nuances that's involved. And that's almost why our organization even exists. Like you can say, oh, I'm a, I'm a retail company and you know, I want to do better retail analytics, but what does that mean, right? Like there's, there's a thousand different topics and things that you can dig into. We listed out sort of the big pillars that you can get into, and there are obviously common topics, but because every organization, even if you're using the same uh, point, point of sale system, every organization uses it differently. And we've had situations where there's like, three or four different companies, they're all in the same industry. They all use the same POS system, but they all use it so differently that we literally had to build separate things for all four of them, even though all the technology is the same. So the short answer is then, I really do think that there will always be people involved um, because every problem is so multidimensional, right? And the dimensions are, the math and stats, the technology itself, and then the pro the unique problem that you and your team has. And if you sort of take those three and multiply them together, there's like an infinite amount of commutation and permutation. No worries. Yeah, so um, the time is 1.29 Eastern. Um, I don't know what time it is in Germany or Morocco, but thank you. thanks everyone. Uh, I'll stay on for another five minutes if anyone has more questions. And we got another one in the chat there, Eric. Hey. Uh, from Nelly, where do you see the future of automation, machine learning, and bots fitting into analytics? Uh, we are still pretty along, 7.30 in Germany. We're, a, I think, a pretty long way off on automated machine learning. like. Our team uses some of those tools, but it, it is very specialized and very problem dependent. So I don't see an organization with no analytics background to just buy a software and you'll do automated machine learning and AI. There are obviously very enterprise specific scalable tools that exist out there. As an example, uh, like they are good chatbots out there that are like natural language processing that you can customize. 
that is very user friendly that you don't need a you know PhD to do. But otherwise, most topics in AI machine learning analytics does require uh, human intervention. If you want, especially if you want it to be good. I just, there's so many sort of these tools out there that's like one size fits all and you can use it out of the box. But we just so many times see the value is not, is not there. There are definitely very specific cases where it, it works well, but most of the time it doesn't. 